next hour with us. This is the launch of what's going to be a continuing series of interviews with photographers I've had the honor of working with as a curator of the exhibition space at the Leica store Soho. My name is Rene Perez and today I'm going to be interviewing Phil Penman. Um, he's a fantastic photographer, a real humanist, and a great friend of Leica Store Soho. Uh, Phil has pretty impeccable credentials, and it's not at all surprising considering he has an incredibly disciplined work schedule. Recently, his book, Street, his first book published, Street, uh, launched as number one uh, in new releases uh, for street photography on Amazon and has been pretty good uh, uh, has been a, a bestseller ever since and is also available at a variety of bookstores around Manhattan and at the MoMA bookstore. Phil has won recognition for his work uh, in particular, he won the Leica Photography International Picture Prize, and he's also been given the distinction, very high distinction, of being uh, one of the most 52 most influential photographers, street photographers, along with uh, Carte Brisson and Sebastian Salgado. Uh, Phil's early days he worked as a street cleaner, garbage hauler, milkman, paper boy, champagne waiter, nightclub barman, DJ, real estate broker. In 2000, Phil moved to the United States. And for the last 20 years, he's been developing a quite extraordinary portfolio. Uh, I'm so glad that Phil did not continue his uh, career as a street cleaner. Uh, but we all know that if he had, he'd be probably the one of the 52 most influential street cleaners in the world. With that, I give you Phil. <laughs> Phil, how are you today? Thank you, Rene. Thanks for the introduction. Love it. Uh, do you, um, you've been very busy here the last few weeks. Yeah. It's, it's been uh, hard keeping up with you. Yeah, it's been um, pretty nonstop. Yeah, I figured uh, with everything that was going on, it was going to slow down a little bit. But I think like the invention of... Uh, these webinar series and our uh, work, everyone's trying to get work done at the moment. So it's been manic, to be honest, which is a good thing. So Yeah, no, it's a great I'll, thing. I'll take it any day. Well, you know, I think so many people are really, have gotten to a point where they just have to get out and they have to do things. And everybody's been putting off work for now for how long? Five months yeah. that um, they're all, uh, roaring to go yeah you know they're just the social distancing and other things that are going on um a list of things here we wanted to talk about uh one of the first ones that i wanted to talk to you about is how you came to the to new york and you had started working with splash news in los angeles but you had not intended to go to los angeles no it was a um it was kind of like you know the the entryway, I kind of just had to jump at it. And it was, you know, working for a celebrity agency. Um, and it was, you know, I've been trying to get here for like six years on and off. Um, and when I was given the opportunity, um, I just had to jump at it. So I, I worked in LA for like six months. And it was one of these things where it was just, I never saw my apartment. I was just traveling nonstop all over the country, covering news stories for the British papers. And I got to see most of the world paid for by someone else, which was quite nice. But you came here, uh, you tell a story about having come to, new, to the US and met at the, at the airport by somebody that said, hey, we've got a job for you. Yeah, um, so I, I literally got off the plane and the, you know, you're expecting Kind of like a little bit of a welcome the, the boss one of the bosses kevin and gary met me at the airport and the first thing he did was uh all right i've got a job for you this weekend you're going to be covering pete sampras's wedding so there i am thinking wow great you know i've literally just got off the plane and my first gig this weekend is going to be official photographer for 
Pete Sampras's wedding. Like this, this is, you know, last week I was shooting check presentations in the UK and now I'm doing that. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> what you're going to be doing is you're going to be walking around with a camera stuffed down your pants, trying to find the bride to be and get a sneak picture of her on the day of the wedding. And, uh, Sure enough, that was my welcome to celebrity life, and uh, with a camera stuck sure down. Enough, it. Sure enough, I, I got the picture. You know, it was the only picture of the day, but it's like uh, I think it freaked out the father a little bit when you see a guy in the lobby kind of taking a camera out of his pants and taking a picture of uh, some guy's daughter. So that was, my <laughs> wel- that was my welcome committee, and then it was just like nonstop learning experience from there. I was. Uh, fortunate enough that I got a very good learning curve working for them. Uh, you then managed to get to New York. Yeah, it was that will get fired, to be honest. I, what, it wasn't really working out in LA, just never really clicked. And they said to me, you know, they, they virtually fired me twice and said, look, we got a position in New York. Here's 500 bucks, go to Ross Dress for Less buy yourself some warm clothes and get on a plane and go to New York. So myself and a guy called Dan, we set up the office in New York and hit the ground running. And like for the next six months, we were just, well, I'd say six months, more like five years, just nonstop work, traveling all over, doing every assignment you can think of. But you primarily were in New York as a paparazzi. Well, I was kind of fortunate in, you know, my, my dream was always to work for the independent newspaper based in New York City shooting features. And I found myself in New York, you know, 22 years old, doing portraits of Christopher Reeve, um, you know, a lot of celebrity portraiture. But at the same time, my bosses said, like, this stuff is very nice, but it doesn't really pay the bills. So you're going to need to learn how to do paparazzi work because that's what pays our income. And when I talk about income, like I looked at the uh, sales reports that I made in one year for them, I think I made $600,000. So I wish I made that, but then, you know, if you talk about a day rate being 500 bucks back in the day, now it's probably like 300 bucks, but $500 day rate versus a $100,000 celebrity picture. So I can understand why they were, you're going to do this. Um, Yeah, that that's, Quite important. Yeah. Survivability. Pay the bills. Uh, now, that brings us to our slideshow here because uh, one of the things that you told me when we were first talking about doing this was how there was a certain sense of, of I don't want to say desperation, but certainly there were miserable moments in being a paparazzi photographer. Yeah. This being one of them. Most of it. Um, it's not a fun job. It's like I said, you can make a lot of money doing it. So there's a big adrenaline rush to want to do it. Um, but inevitably this is kind of what you were doing. You were riding around on a bicycle in the snow with a pair of snow goggles, um, looking for celebrity pictures or out in a hundred degree weather, sweating your ass off, chasing cars around the city, looking for celebrities. And, you know, we did it because it, it made money. Um, and you, the thing is, once like I went freelance, uh, all of a sudden you start making real money. You're not like on a salary anymore. Now it's like you can put down a deposit on a property if you get a good picture, which, um, so you, you get into it, you, you get addicted to the adrenaline of it, adrenaline of it, but it was, you know, a miserable job if you didn't get pictures or if you didn't see a celebrity that day. It was well, one of the things you told me was that um, at a certain point, and this is a good example, that when you couldn't get an exclusive picture, you just shot the scene as opposed to trying to get that one extra picture that will not have a resale value. Yeah, it's like the market kind of crashed, really. You know, we went from making all this money to uh, the agency started these things called subscription deals where you were seeing 60 cents a picture. So like a typical picture like this with Paris Paris Hilton, um, if you were on an exclusive, you could, you could make a few thousand dollars maybe. As soon as one other guy showed up, unless you cut a deal with them where you were kind of like, you know, we'll split the money 50-50, 
um, you can make some money. But say like this, 10 guys show up, um, inevitably you're gonna make 60 cents. So I figured it was better, and creatively as well, I wanted to take pictures again, um, was to do, I did like a behind the scenes of the paparazzi photographers that I worked with. And you, and you, you, know, said, you said you usually did this with your Leica M7 early on, then the M9. Um, yeah as opposed to the Canon equipment, which you shot the, uh, uh, the, the long lens stuff of the celebrities. So I, I had two setups in my bag. I had like a Canon with a two, well, a Canon 200 to 400. And then at the other side of my bag, I had like a, an M9, an M7. Um, I bought a bunch of R, R8s, R9s, film cameras. And I just kind of, that was my mental separation was if I was with my Leica, then I was shooting creative. And if I had my Canon, I was shooting for the money and the celebrity. So that was kind of my divide. And I literally had it divided in the, in the like a bag that I had made for me. Um, so that was kind of my, uh, my thing, my creative way of getting out there. So your creative arc actually started pretty much at this point where you, where you divided the work, the work from the personal work, the commercial work from the personal work. Well, I, I was originally a photographer, you know, well, it's all photography, but uh, right. I started as a news photographer, you know, shooting features, portrait shoots. I worked for Microsoft doing corporate portraiture. So I'd already, I'd always been into create, the creative process. And then the celebrity stuff, like I said, it was an addiction and you just, you did it for the money. And after a while, once, it's, once you start seeing 60 cents sales, where you can't even afford to pay for a coffee, you find yourself... <laughs> You know, I'd rather take pictures of Ozzy Osbourne like this with, um, you know, the, the fans taking pictures or the photographers taking pictures. And it, it gave me access to stuff that most people wouldn't get. And that brings me to another story you told me. Um, <clears throat> and this goes back to what I've been thinking is important with your work is that consistently, regardless of what you're doing, you develop relationships with either the individuals that you're photographing or in this case of this story about Madonna, uh, the people that were working around her. Yeah, it's, um, that was the, the whole deal was kind of how you treated them. You know, a lot of the time you would have to give up pictures. Maybe they didn't want to be shot that day, but you knew they were going to give you a good picture the other day, the next day. So it was kind of like you, you would try to work with some of them or you would try to be seen as the good guy or, you know, however it would work. So Madonna, she was kind of always, uh, I had certain key celebrities that I like to work on, Britney Spears, Madonna, you know, Angelina Jolie, the ones that would sell. So I would try to um, like work hard on them. Like, so Madonna, when she would come into town, I would work like obsessively on her. If she was in for two weeks, I would work every single day and maybe four days out of two weeks, I get pictures. So, one of the days, I don't know if you have that shot, but it's, um, I was normally, what would happen would be, the cars would come out with police sirens on, there would be 15, you know, 15 cars, bicycles, motorbikes, everyone would be chasing Madonna around the city, there'd be police sirens running all the red lights and she would lose everybody. And I kind of got this reputation where I would always keep up with them. I'd be like the last one standing. And they actually took a bet one day where they had like a, a, a fake Madonna drive all around the city for two hours with me chasing. And the security had a bet on who would be the last one standing. And if I was lucky, it was me and they bought me a drink. So after like two weeks of doing this, this was like a similar thing. I followed her one day and she went to this film set where Guy Ritchie was filming some car commercial. And I was getting all these great pictures. You know, she's posing up in front of the camera. There's about 20 security guards standing behind her. No one's blocking me. I'm just getting all this great stuff. And eventually she leaves after like a couple of hours. And, you know, I'm all exclusive, you know, panicking that other photographers are going to show up. But I've got all this great stuff. And then all of a sudden, the sound guy comes up to me. And he's like, I, you know, I don't know what you did to impress her. But, man, she loves you. And I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, well, I had a mic up the whole time because she's doing behind the scenes and she said that guy's been chasing me on a bicycle for two weeks he can take whatever pictures he wants yeah. and we ended up uh making a load of money off of these pictures and 
you know, all you need is one set like that and you're kind of set for six months. So she was but good. Again, you had developed a, a, a relationship with various individuals along the way that eventually achieved this. Yeah, a lot of the time, if they see you working hard, like she's obviously a, a hard worker, you know, you don't get to that position without being a hard worker. And I know some of them, like their nickname, a couple of them, they called me Tour de France. <clears throat> and um, I think the, the way they look at it is that if you work hard you, and you, you look like you're working hard, um, they have a respect for that, a mutual respect for that. So it benefited me a lot of the time that I would, you know, drop. 50 pounds in body weight because I'm on a bike 12 hours a day. So that brings us to a ne uh, the next point. I, I don't know if this was a big change in your career, but I know that it had a huge impact on you personally, the 9-11. And you said you were at home and you got a phone call? Yeah, I, you know, it affected everyone, but yeah, it's... So the morning of was my first day off. I'd been, like I said, working six months straight. It was my first day off, phone rings. Um, I didn't want to pick it up because I knew it was going to be work. Normally I would wait for the second call to go. They would call my home phone and that never happened. And a voicemail went on myself. So I figured, right, it's my mum or somebody. And I picked it up, phone, um, there's a plane that's hit one of, the, one of the towers. I turned the TV on saw what was going on, jumped on my bike. I was down there five minutes later and this was it. Um, I was photographing for about 40 minutes before uh, the building came down right in front of me and nobody expected that. And then I went into, ran into JNR music and then came out to this. Um, you know, what do you say really? Uh, nothing I'll ever see, I hope, will ever be like this again. And it's just, it's one of those things that you want to be there as a photographer, but at the same time, you don't want it to happen either. So, you know, it's, yeah, go ahead. It's yeah, it's, it's affected me. I, I'm, I found that I'm, I'm better now because I've seen the pictures so much and I've gone through the pictures and I've spoken about them so much that it's definitely helped, but it took me a few years before I could mentally get my head around it. Um, and one of the things that impressed me about these pictures, because I, I chose the pictures for a variety of reasons, but for the most part, it was random that I chose these particular pictures. And you ended up naming many of these pictures, many of these people in the pictures. For example, the security guy over here, who you said made the first call in about the airplane crashing. And then you know all of these gentlemen. Yes. You didn't necessarily meet them on the spot, but over time, you develop relationships with them. Yeah, so um, Joe Kelly on the left, unfortunately, he's passed away. Uh, Shrinath in the middle, I was actually drinking whiskey with him earlier this year down in uh, Florida. And George on the right, uh, he's a fellow Englishman. I, I've been out to see him in Ohio. Um, and I... I've written back and forth with George for the last 20 years and just have a close connection um, with a lot of people. I think anyone that was down there kind of has that. Yeah, you know, uh, as having been a news photographer early in my career, <clears throat> I would take a picture like this, but I could never imagine having 20 years later uh, a relationship with any or all of these individuals. Individuals and this next picture, this woman on the left, she ended up inviting you to her wedding as her photographer and probably as a friend as well. Yeah, we um, so I met Joanne in like 2015. I was introduced to her through the 9 11 Museum. Um, and you know, we we met and then we began chatting, and then like I said, she um invited me to be her photographer on her wedding day, so that was a, a special moment, and then you know, we'll go down to the site on the memorial and she's become a very dear friend to me. Well, and you know, in a way that ends up closing the loop for you, at least in a certain way, that other people who may have experienced the tragedy and having maybe even had things happen to them that were traumatic, 
um, they didn't have a way of kind of closing the loop with a number of people and following, you know, and in the case of the three gentlemen in the front, one of them recently died. In her case, the opposite, she's starting her life. And that's a very interesting aspect to, to this. And also it speaks to a little bit about the way you work. Yeah, you know, um, it's given me some closure and also that, you know, something good, like I've met some good relation, had some good relationships with people from this as well. Um, there are other people that I've met as well that we don't have photographed. I would like to, you know, I would love to be able to get in touch with everyone that I photographed, even if it's just sharing the story. Um, you know, when I met George, he wanted to hear my story because he's like, everyone knows my story, but no one, I don't know how you got down there and took your pictures. So I remember driving to the airport with him and the oh. first time someone had ever asked me what I did or how I felt. So mm. it was good to be able to share it with someone like that. So a lot of the work that I see of yours and that I know you as, because when I first saw your work, I knew you did paparazzi work. I knew that somewhat around 9-11, but didn't have any depth into it. And I know you approached me and about doing some work. And I was like, well, maybe some paparazzi would be good. Maybe some celebrity portraits would be good. But once I started seeing this, it was a completely different thing. And this brings me to how I titled this interview as New York as your muse. Obviously, the paparazzi stuff is important, and 9-11 is important, but the, the paparazzi in particular mainly gave you an access to the city that you may not otherwise get because you're on the bicycle all the time, and you saw things that you, we as photographers wouldn't see in the quantity that you saw. It. Um, so how do you feel about New York City as a motivator a motivator for your artwork it's everything absolutely everything um couldn't be anywhere else i came here in 94 as a kid wanted literally cried on the way home didn't want to leave and spent the next six years trying to get here i, I would come here like two three times a year taking pictures for myself like i said finally got the um the opportunity to get here in 2000 and it's everything man um, the only time I really feel at peace is when I walk around drinking my coffee, walking around the city and <clears throat> just being able to chat with people. That's kind of my, my reset. Like I have a couple of resets. One is going to a diner in New Jersey in the weekend. Another one is going and drinking my coffee as I'm walking around the city and just chatting with people. Obviously, when I was a paparazzi photographer, I'd be chatting with people all day, every day. You knew the coffee vendors, you knew everybody. You know, Google thought that Finelli's was my home address because I spent so much right. time. Yeah, there. and it was, it always seemed like that's where I would see you. Right. I'd leave the store to go buy a that cup was, of, of soup, and there you'd be. Yeah, it was, that was like if you were riding around for hours and you needed to just reset, that would be like you would go and get your coffee at the Finelli's. And you stand on the corner and you always knew that there might be a celebrity walking by, but you could stand there, have your coffee, relax, and hope that they came to you. So, yeah. And it's I've a run into a couple of celebrities there, although they were mainly hiding their faces. Oh, yeah. Round so, in, in a lot of your photographs, there is very strong, um, you have a very powerful use of the silhouette. I, a lot of photographers use silhouette, I use silhouette, but the way you silhouette people and objects, it gives them a very strong definition and in a way a very symbolic reason for being there. They all of a sudden become archetypes of themselves when you see them. But this picture, well, this is one of the first pictures I saw of you. Again, you know, you see all these people in silhouettes. It makes the, the, the entire composition and the, I mean, you would have a great picture with one or two people there and that particular combination of the, of the roadway, the underpass and, and the bridge, but you start placing people in there and new meanings come up. You know, there's relationships going on. There's a woman touching the shoulder. It looks like of somebody or a person touching the shoulder of somebody else or somebody standing there 
you know, the bike riding by. So all of a sudden, everything kind of, kind of comes very symbolic and important of itself. This particular picture I've been thinking a lot of, and we talked about how, or I've talked about how you have a tendency to bring your, your central point down lower. In this case, you can see that the horizon is running above the eye level. So it's actually not typical uh, of how you would see it, certainly if you were standing there, but by doing that, you've, you've e extended the, the view of the ceiling, you've extended the view in the, in the reflection, but you're also using a very, very classical composition. You know, it's like the Renaissance vanishing perspective. Um, and I, I see that in what you do, that some of your compositions are really quite classical. Um, and certainly this one, and I had to go and, and research that Renaissance period where they were starting to use perspective a lot, and this just fits right into it. So, and then you have the, the two silhouettes and the fountain centered perfectly and reflected perfectly. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty phenomenal composition. It's uh, a bit, uh, again, going to a scene, I picked it because of the weather. It was the only time I knew I could isolate the backdrop was if it was fixed snow. And then just anytime I go to like an iconic spot in New York, I'm always trying to figure out, all right, what's a picture that hasn't been shot before? And it might be standing up against the wall for 20 minutes looking around at everything and just figuring out, all right, what can, what can I do that might be slightly different? Because this is probably one of the most shot places in New York City. And yeah. always just trying to find, you know, it might be, you know, this one was lucky in that I had somebody walking a dog, you know, I was standing there for a long time and didn't see a single person. Um, and it might be the, the, the shape of the silhouette of the person might not be right as well. So it might be that you shoot a few different variations and this was the one that worked and you know i had one with the dog in the middle and it just didn't work as well so it's you know you got to put yourself in the place to make your luck to get the picture i guess well and letting the the story evolve so to speak because as you say it didn't say the same with the dog in the middle well you would break up the composition at any rate with anything in the middle because the the fountain is so strong in this and it's amazing how just the slightest change can can completely make a pic make or break a picture. Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, but again, you know, this is uh, you you work very you work a lot with strong contrast and and a lot of silhouettes. Um, you have an architectural sense to a lot of what you do. Uh, it, you had mentioned back earlier when I first met you that you use silver effects a lot. You don't use that so much anymore. No, I kind of um, I was having doubling up all my images every time. So I, I switched to Capture One about a year ago and I use uh, Capture One now. Just streamlined everything for me and made it a lot easier. Um, you know, this is kind of like a lot of earlier photography where I was still kind of learning. And, you know, a lot of it, like you're shooting just for fun, really. You're playing around with silhouettes, but you're not really uh, developing a story with them. It's like the last shot previously, you know, it's nice architecture and it, you know, you get the, the shape of the hat and the person, but I, I wanted to start like trying to, you know, develop more on that and start to add more things to uh, my imagery. And, and this one, I, bring up particularly because it has a shadow, it has the architecture, it has the perspective, but it has the person that becomes the entire anchor for the picture, not in silhouette, but still in a pose that tells you a lot about what's going on, the way his feet are crossed, the, his, his hand just has a certain tension in it, he's leaning just a certain way. So you can have the greatest scene conceivable in terms of light and composition, but if you don't have that one last piece of information that brings it all together, yeah. uh, and you, you do it over and over again. Yeah. See, this, this is one that we discussed in that regard. Yeah, this is kind of like further along where um, kind of learned from those earlier pictures where like you're starting to build a scene more like, um, it's not such an obvious picture where, you know, you have this beautiful light coming down, you have the shadows on the ground, you start adding 
like you know people walking around giving it scale but I, I spent probably about an hour of photographing down you know people in the shadows and it wasn't until I was walking away and leaving that I kind of saw this and all it took was you know, just the right person coming down the stairwell and then it's like you know the right body movement so if the arm wasn't up like that it wouldn't have worked as well and it's such a mundane gesture it looks like he's adjusting his backpack yeah but at the same time it makes every it it just makes the entire picture and if you were doing an architectural photograph that that balcony sticking out like that depending on your light and the like may or may not work but here without that one in a way not without that gesture i don't think it would have been the same image at all it wouldn't have worked it was like literally it caught my glimpse uh, that i saw somebody else coming down prior and then i was you know you see it and then it's like well how can i work this um to get the picture that i want and it might you know i was probably there for like 20 minutes waiting for the right silhouette to come down and then also you need separation with the people in the sh in the silhouette um in the shadows on the right hand side as well which is not as easy to get all it takes is one person to be in the wrong spot right, right. slightly to the left and it doesn't work you know you had, you had mentioned that this place only lasted a few days or a few weeks this location for the skateboarders and that skateboarders would probably not like this picture yeah it's a horrible skateboarding picture i've been told that many times um I, but I put this picture up and I'll have like a million people asking me, where's that location? And I think Nike put it up for like a month. Um, but, you know, for me, it wasn't so much. It's not about skateboarding. It was, again, love of the city, Empire State. You know, you have an epic background and then just adding like little elements. It was like these little stories that are going on. It doesn't. Yeah, because each, each silhouette has a different story going on. Each each way each person is standing there tells you something different yeah so it was more it's more about a scene than a, a skateboard shot you know with the right trick that they're doing you know also um one of the other areas besides these these type of architectural pictures let's call them uh you have a intense interest in costume portraits uh, this is on Jersey Street, one of my favorite streets in the city. Uh, it seems like every time I go by there, something is going on. They're filming a, a commercial. There's somebody testing something out, a skateboard or something. I see relationships started. I see relationships ended. You know, just always something going on. So when I saw this picture of the mariachis, I was really taken by it because being from Texas, San Antonio, there are, the mariachis are just everywhere and uh, ubiquitous. So to have them transplanted in New York City like this was a beautiful scene for me. Yeah, this is the beauty of the bike, you know, riding around the city. And one of the reasons I love New York is because you just see everything, you know? Um, you, can, you can wear whatever the hell you want. There's no restrictions. Um, no one's gonna say anything because everyone kind of expects it. You know, it was one of the things I loved about it. I came, I used to come here and buy like huge baggy hip hop clothing and wear them in England. And over there, you'd be like freak boy. Over here, nobody would care. So that's kind of another reason I just wanted to be here. Like just crazy shit every single day, um, walking around, you know. I still, just, I'm not on a bike every day anymore, but just walking around, you see some crazy stuff. And just lucky enough to have my camera on me to be able to, get these pictures really you had said you were you were uh staking out somebody here yeah that was i was on a stakeout waiting for um katie holmes she she used to live in that building on the left and all of a sudden i see this woman and a friend walking down the street and i'm like sub the stakeout you know this is a much better picture so i just ran across and quickly asked if i could get a portrait a lot a lot of my work is not like uh, how I call it, like shock and awe street photography is not, I, I, I'm more into uh, going up and just doing a straight up portrait. You know, something like this might be 
I was riding down Prince Street and just happened to come across this guy walking down the street. And it's another one of those where, you know, for me, the portrait, if I'd gone up to them and asked them for a portrait, it wouldn't have worked. You know, this oh. one this one works better because of the kid looking and you see the sign of Worcester Street. Yeah, also, every time I look at some of these pictures, and I've said this before, I always feel like as if this man, or could be a woman, was actually walking on the moon just milliseconds before they appeared there. It's like they stepped through a time warp and right. they ended up here. And, you know, on the corner of Prince and uh, Worcester Street. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it, they always seem like they, that, and although we always see this kind of stuff, you, the way, part, part of it is how you photograph it. And you have a way of approaching people. Obviously, you've already made the connection with them, whether you just met them or you had talked to them before or, or they wanted to be photographed, probably in this case. But I think between the aperture you use to keep a uh, shallow depth of focus, uh, not worrying about the background washing out, and going at a slightly lower angle, you create a, an environment where the people really stand out almost as if they don't belong there. And the environment in the back doesn't become part of the story. Right. I, I kind of look before I even, if I see something like this one, I was actually across the street doing another portrait at the time. And what I'll do, like if I see someone, before I even go over to, and approach them, I'll kind of get an idea of what I'm gonna use as a backdrop. I'll preset my camera to get the exposure roughly how I want it before I even approach them. Because most of the people you have maybe two seconds with them. You know, it's not like you have time to do a whole shoot. So. I want to be ready to go where it's just like, you know, I ask them and I already know what I'm going to do. And, you know, I'll sit, most of the stuff I shoot at 35, on a 35, 1.4, stick it at 1.4, focus on the eyes. And like you said, I, I'll usually come down to about waist level. And normally it's a, it, normally it's a uh, full length. I went for a stage of shooting predominantly full length because I was kind of into, you know, the full, what they're wearing. <laughs> this one is great. They're tall. They're twins. Yeah. Uh, you've isolated them from the background. You've gone at a lower angle, so they almost seem like they're statues. Oh no, I'm, I'm standing at six foot high. They're just seven foot five people. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you're 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 barely. The camera is barely waist level here. I can see. Yeah. Uh, and again, going back to how you interact with people. This is a, a strong picture for me. I know you do a lot of Comic-Con pictures and I've seen them, they're fantastic. This one I like because of the relationship between these two people. And as you pointed out, these are not over the top costumes. Right. They're kind of handmade or, you know, there's something about them, they're not complete, but it's got a lot of enthusiasm. That's kind of what I look for, it's like the, the like when Comic Con's in town, the best pictures are usually 10 blocks away from Comic Con. And I'm looking, you know, I'll station up on a corner of a corner of a street. Normally when you go up to these people, they want to be photographed and they they love that you ask. And I'm, I'm more attracted to the people that, like you said, they're handmade costumes. They just look better to me. Um, this man, uh, fully dressed. Who knows where he's going? He's probably maybe just going shopping or just going for a walk. Stylish guy, you know? Like, I like anyone that makes an effort when they go out. And that grabs me straight away. This is an interesting picture because of the juxtaposition of two unrelated ideas. You said he would just happen to be there uh, practicing. Yeah, he, he didn't even see the thing on the wall. I was kind of riding straight towards, if this was on Canal Street, I'm, I'm riding right towards him and I just, quickly said, can I grab a portrait? And um, I said, he wanted to know why. And I said, because you look great with the, the kids saying just right next to <laughs> you. He didn't realize that it was there. So he, he kind of agreed to do it. I like what you said about this, that this guy is just out of or trying to get back into the 80s. 
with his boombox. We, we all are. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I don't, like I said, anyone that makes an effort. He's making an effort to get into a 1940s gangster film. Yep, they're coming back. This one, I was just passing, walking up 7th Avenue, and this guy walked out of a hotel to get in a car, and I just quickly grabbed him, uh, and he just went straight into pose, you know? I didn't have to say anything. <laughs> yeah, he, he, it's almost like he expected you to be there and was ready. Yeah, exactly. So this picture starts another section of what I want to go over. Uh, but it speaks to being the opposite, in a way, of the picture in Central Park with the Bethesda Fountain and the low angle and the reflections. Because this one, you said, you didn't even know you had made, but you had been working on a picture from this angle for some time. Yeah, I... Nice, you know, it was great weather that day. When I say great, miserable. Um, put my rain gear on and I had an idea of a shot that I wanted and it was like people walking across the street basically in the gap and I had like a, a piano being moved I had all kind of different scenarios but it wasn't until I got home that I realized I had this freak freak image with this umbrella just perfectly placed and you know I, I wouldn't be able to replicate this picture if I had a guy going up and down all day in a car you know there's just no way Sometimes it just works out. So this speaks to the opposite and back to the picture of the Pedaza Fountain that you work on these images for some time. You, you try different things and you like to really make use of the weather. But also this kind of, when I first saw this picture, it was a different fill. It was a little bit on the dark side. Yeah. Probably hadn't had enough coffee that morning, that's all I can say. Um, it's, you know, again, like I got up really early. I wanted to get out in the snow before the uh, cars mess everything up. And just walking up Madison Avenue and just saw, I noticed that all the, all the lights were red. So I just started working the picture and waiting for that right moment. Um, you know, the right, this one was waiting like 30 minutes just for a person, to be mm. honest. Um, but, it, you know, the... Not everything's perfect about it, but I think that's what makes it kind of nice, to be honest. And so you've got the taxi coming in. No, yeah, yeah, of course. No, you don't want, not everything is supposed to be perfect. But these two pictures kind of show the opposite because a lot of people, you know, street photography, you just happen to be there. You, you just happen to catch that one moment. And then there was nothing before, there was nothing after. This is a moment that you captured but you had been, you had actually gotten other things that were quite interesting, but without this combination, it would be hard. Well, you can't do better. You can't do much better. This one isn't the flip side. You worked on this for some time. You get a vision and then you just keep on doing as many variables or variations as possible. I'm sure you had green lights, yellow lights, and no I lights, did, maybe. I did it without. Uh, I did it without cars. I did just red lights. I did one where it was green lights for a person. And it was the, you know, the, this was the clear winner. This is kind of just having fun, to be honest. Like, um, a lot of the time, if I if I'm, can't get my head in the right place for taking pictures, I'll just walk and find where uh, the light is hitting the steam stack. And yeah. just, I'm doing it just to, like, get my brain thinking again, like, trying different angles. And this is kind of one of these scenarios where it's just, I'm shooting it just more for fun and just to get my brain. So now you, you also went to a different, um, you, you went to color. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we know you primarily as black and white. So this was a, a shift in our, a shift in style or, or are I'm, you still, it but, just, this one just happened to work best in color. Yeah, it just worked better. Um, I, you know, I shoot color all the time for work. So color was always, I don't know, for me mentally, it was always work. And mm -hmm. black and white was kind of like me. So I, I always edit everything in color and in black and white. 
and to see which, you know, there's some, like the one with the red lights, you know, that's the only way it would work. Um, things like this, I just prefer in black and white. You know, Thank another, you this one. yeah, it's another example. It just wouldn't work as well in black and white. So I have both, you know, the background might work well in black and white, but the, it really needs that color pop to it. And it's still, it's still a very muted image, but it's not, you know, well, you've got great separations in the grays. Uh, the traffic light stands out against the gray. Doesn't all just become mush. Um, right. But yet, it's not sharp. I mean, it looks like the green light itself is probably the point of focus. Yeah. But for the most part, it's not uh, the sharpest picture ever. But it's not a matter of sharp. It's just a matter of feeling and mood. It, it really pulls across very well. But it has a very moody sense to it. And what I was talking about the other day was that I feel like this was a premonition to what came after that, which is COVID. This is Madison Avenue. In the middle of the day, there's only one person out there. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, why most people were bunkered up, I was working for the newspapers covering COVID every day. So I, I, like I said, I've been manic because I haven't stopped working you know, there was no point where I stopped and I've been doing, it's been, it's been tough, but it's also been very interesting seeing how the streets have changed over the past few months, kind of like the, the early stages was a lot of fear. And then, you know, this is like a local grocery store that I go to out in New Jersey and just seeing how people were um, acting. So, you know, this was early morning Chinatown, just very... Um... The interesting thing about these is already it seems like this time has passed. And I don't see us going back to this kind of period. I hope not. And, and it's interesting because when I first put this slideshow together, it seemed very, very of the moment, but now they don't. And that's just been a few weeks. Yeah. Now the story, the story that you've wanted to tell primarily with this is the story of the homeless who have been greatly overlooked. Yeah, that was, uh, to me, being out there the whole time, the one thing that was clear was the homeless um, everywhere. And the fact that the only story that I saw was that they were being kicked off the subway at night because they were messing up the subways. And I'm, it kind of annoyed me that that was the only story that I saw. So- Oh, you're I, right, I remember that. Yeah, so I kind of like, you know, I would, because they were the only people on the street, they would be the people that I would talk to during the day and kind of get a feel up of what was going on. So I kind of wanted to start telling the story of, you know, the people that were out there and do it in, you know, try to do it in a dignified way. You know, it's not me lying in garbage. This is me on the street. And, you know, I'd be talking to people and being like, you know, what are you getting? And they're like, nothing, because the restaurants are all shut, so there's no food, you know? Normally they would get the food off the street. Um, no one's, you know, nobody's giving them masks. So it was just a very important story that I wanted to tell. And one of the important things that I try to establish this early on in this discussion is that you've really developed uh, relationships with many people. Earlier on, you were able to tell me each person's name that we were looking at. You, you mentioned this gentleman. You photographed this gentleman more than once. Is that not right? Yeah, he's kind of like, um, I, I've seen him for like the last three years straight from when I moved to this neighborhood. And I, I would see him daily. And one day I was walking past and he, um, he asked me if I'd take his picture. And he gave me this great smile. And, you know, I, I see him daily now. There's a few, quite a lot of them now. I recognize the same people um, and know most of them, to be honest. This is a guy called Charlie, um, who I think this was out in front of Macy's. I've seen him a couple of times now. He was supposed to. He was supposed to go back to Toronto where he's from. And obviously when COVID hit, nothing was, no one was going anywhere. Uh, this guy's Tom, a uh, guy called Tommy. So I met Tommy from, um, 
I was walking down Broadway just from Union Square and I saw the sanitation people literally frying everything, all their possessions in the back of the sanitation truck. And Tommy and a friend were moving their possessions down the street, everything they could keep. And he had a great jacket that said, um, it was like, fuck everything on the back of his jacket. And I, I went up to him and said, I wanted to take a picture of your jacket. And he said, oh, where are you from? And I said, oh, England. And he's, he said, yeah, I'm from England too. And I was like, well, whereabouts? And he's like, oh, I'm from Bournemouth. And I'm like, no shit, I was born in Paul, which is literally about five miles away. And we, we got chatting and knew a lot of the same places and uh, got chatting, you know, I wanted to do his portrait. So he, he changed his jacket because he wanted this one. But, you know, he, he used to be a classical pianist and he was a fashion model over here for a few years until kind of things went bad. And he's now living on the street about 10 blocks away from the luxury housing he used to live in. And that was one of the things that I wanted to, to point out with this is that not everybody are from the chronically homeless people. Right. Uh, in this case, this gentleman, whatever, whatever his other issues are, do, does have skills. And part of the reason he's here is because things have just closed down for him and he has no opportunity like this gentleman. Yeah. Um, this guy is uh, called Sumay. He's from Thailand. And I was actually, this is the same spot where the silhouette bridge shop was earlier. And I was just down there taking, I was doing recon for a, a commercial job that I was doing. And he came up to me and kind of wanted to show me where he was living and he wanted someone to know and he wanted to tell his story so we did a few pictures um he had all his possessions like in, in front of the one of those walls very neat you know neatly put mm. and uh he used to be a welder he's now uh, he was working for a restaurant in chinatown and lost his job due to covid and everything shutting down and you know just he said there's about 50 of them living down there um this guy that I see all the time, uh, I didn't, the day that I saw him for this picture, I was actually out doing tests on a Noctilux that I, would, I, would, I had for a couple of weeks. And I saw him backing up towards me in a, a wheelchair and I saw the hat. And normally when I go up to someone, you know, if they ask you why, I wanted, why you want to do the picture, I said, because that's an awesome hat, you know, it's very patriotic. So I got chatting with him, you know, um, I see, I see him around, like I said, all the time, sometimes more drunk than others. Um, he's kind of like a local character. He's from originally from Morris County, I believe, but it just made for a good portrait. Yeah. And the first thing I thought of, well, the first two things I thought of, again, going back to the Renaissance photograph of under the, under or yeah, under that bridge with the Bethesda fountain, is that this reminds me, face-wise, texture-wise, of Rembrandt, but the hat reminds me of Van Gogh. And it, I can't move on beyond that. It's, you know, what's interesting is that you've done this beautiful portrait of this street person this man, you, 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 you're, you know him fairly well over the years, but it's such an incredibly beautiful photograph of him. Whether he'll ever see it, has he seen this picture? No, I should show him actually. I Who knows how he would react? <laughs> That's the thing, you never know. Like people, and you know, the other day I saw him and he was picking up a trash can and trying to throw it as he was drunk and so probably not the best time to go and show him the picture but i'll try him another time so we're going to step out of that to this particular picture and i'm showing this picture partially because of the point we are at historically and so much of us so many of us and probably everybody in their own way is stuck in a bubble of their making of who they are and where they are um, and although this is, was a commercial shoot, is that not correct? I think it, was a, it was like a low, a very low key video shoot in Times Square. But I, apparently she's a very, um, famous artist, but I've, once I quit that business, I'm afraid I tuned out and I don't know who anybody mm. is 
the moment, which is kind of nice. Uh, but, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just, I just like you said, like living in a bubble, right? Um, I can't wait to see the music video, but it's a great idea, and uh, it worked for me as a picture because, like, using it in the, you know, in the surrounding empty streets. So, yeah, I, I'm quite happy with that one. It's a nice find. Let's put it that way. So we're, we're, we've we've had one particular question more than once, which is, what's your what lenses do you normally use? Uh, I assume that a lot of the earlier stuff, the, so to speak, architectural photographs, were probably shot, uh, let's go back to this. That's with like a 24, maybe? Yeah, I had a 24, 1.4. My, my main lens is uh, I have a uh, 35, 1.4, which tends to be my go-to, a 75 F2. Uh, I had the Noctilux, which is... Uh, unbelievable lens <laughs> trying to figure out how I'm going to get one of them but uh yeah and then I have like a 24 to 90 that I use on the SL and I also have a 90 to 280 that I use on the SL quite a lot so these days are you primarily working with the SL uh for commercial yeah uh for myself I just splashed out and bought an M10 monochrome which is <laughs> say no more <laughs> Uh, this one you said was shot with the 90 to 280. Yeah, that's uh, the on the SL with the 90 to 280. I use that lens a lot, actually. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a monster, but on the other hand, the balance of it is really quite good. And I'm I've been surprised that on the few times that I've used it, that while I was using it, I forgot about its weight and I forgot about everything about it because it just works so well. Yeah, and to be, to be perfectly honest, compared to the 600s and 800s that I used to have to lug around, this is fine. It's no no big deal anymore. So do you have any thoughts or, or any ideas that you'd like to share with uh, our viewers? Uh, well, I'm kind of, like I said, I've been working pretty much nonstop. I've uh, been doing a lot of stuff with Leica Academy. Um, I do one-to-one -one tuition. If anyone's interested, you can look at on the oh, uh, bespoke page. Um, yeah, bespoke. Um, really, I all, I really enjoyed the teaching. To be honest, I've done a few workshops where we've gone around the city and the bespoke stuff online. I'm doing a lot of that. I'm shooting a lot of commercial work. Uh, I've been working on a series down in Atlantic City, which is kind of interesting to say the least what's kind of going on down there at the moment and yeah just like my day-to-day -day going out shooting portraits street portraits and kind of documenting how history is kind of playing out really it's every single day is different and you know like you said that nothing has changed but yet we um there's a lot more people on the street you know so no, it's, anybody oh sorry uh, if anybody wants to see more of Phil's work, you can go to his website, philpenman.com, or visit him on Instagram, Phil Penman. Uh, street, street, the book Street was published by Glitterati Editions and is available at these various locations, including uh, Metropolitan Museum, no, M Museum, wait. Yeah, no. Museum of Modern Art, have that wrong. I, I thought there was something right, right about that. Uh, and Photographiska, which is a new go-to photographic museum in the city. Um, our next interview will be with Jean-Pierre Lafont, uh, Photographer's Paradise, Turbulent America, 1960 to 1980. That's his book, also published by Glitterati. Um, we don't have an exact date for that, but we will be announcing it soon, and it'll be in mid-September. Uh, unless you've got something amazing uh, to tell us, some revelation, some great wisdom, I guess we're done with you. I, I look forward to seeing you in the store, to be honest. So I'll be, I'll be down there with my coffee as soon as I can. Yeah, and I suspect that uh, I should mention that the Leica store in New York Soho is on the brink of reopening. 
we had to kind of reorganize the store a little bit, but uh, probably within the next week, we will be open, fully open, with uh, the door and the windows completely uncovered. So everybody, please make your way over to the Leica store sometime next week. Give us a call before you come so we can prepare for you and make it all nice and sanitary. Um, but uh, we look forward to seeing everybody. Great. Look forward to seeing you. Okay, thanks a lot, Phil. Thanks a lot, man. Have a good day, everyone.